Hello, friends, and welcome to this podcast. I'm going to talk about music, um, and I'm going to talk about pop music, uh, because I like pop music. And sometimes when you talk about pop music, people are like, oh, no, he's going to talk about Beyonce or something. And like, no, I'm not going to talk about popular music. I'm going to talk about pop music. And I... I sort of had my formative years in the 80s when I first started playing music and getting into bands and things and starting to become aware of songwriting and attempting to do it myself, write my own songs. And I think I became fascinated with the idea of what makes a pop song. Why are some pop songs so exciting and so thrilling and so moving and so emotionally engaging and so compelling you know why do some pop songs hit me so hard why do they why does it get into my mind and imprint itself on me there's some pop songs that i listened to back then that when i listen to them now takes me right back to those times it's a it is a sort of a magical transformative thing this music um and one of the bands that I really liked back then, but it was kind of intimidating to me because I felt like they kind of came out of nowhere. They they had some other albums before the one I'm about to talk about that I didn't really like very much. I didn't like their first couple of albums. And it turns out later, I'll explain why their first album, why I didn't like it very much. Um, but this album, when it came out, I got it oddly because I didn't really like their first work I still went ahead and bought this one you know without hearing any of the songs on it because I think I like the cover I like the the uh, cover of this album and the band is called Squeeze um and the album is called Argy Bargy or and when I first bought it I think I called it Argy Bargy I didn't know how to pronounce it. And I think it's called argy bargy. And I think it's a word for like nonsense. If somebody's talking crap, they're they're talking argy bargy. I believe that's what it means. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, I love the cover. It looks like a color Xerox. It looks like a, like several layers, several generations of, of photocopy, you know, where they, they keep photocopying and it keeps getting more and more degraded. Um, but there's your band members. These are all your people, your squeeze people that you know and love. You know, you got your Jules Holland and you got your Glenn Tilbrook um, and all the other members of this band. But what happened when I got this album, I was I was in a band. It was kind of poppy, uh, kind of heavy poppy pop band. I guess people called us New Wave. I don't know what they called us. Um, some people called us punk rock because we had kind of loud guitars, but I was writing songs. And when this album came out, I felt a little intimidated by the songwriting on here. I have to say, I felt like, you know, why am I even bothering to write songs when there's songs out there that are so far beyond what I can write? And that was this album to me. I listened to it with a kind of love-hate thing at first, which is weird because I loved this album so much, but it also made me feel very inadequate and insecure. It made me feel like I should, you know, I should give up this crazy dream of wanting to be in a, in a pop band and go back to a more realistic dream of wanting to be a comic book artist. Um, so anyway, this album has got so many great songs on it. It's got, you know, songs that you probably know, Pulling Muscles from the Shell, Another Nail in My Heart, um, Farfisa Beat, If I Didn't Love You. Um, every song on here is great. Every song is incredible. Um, but there's a song on here called Separate Beds that is such a beautiful song. It's a it's one of those songs about youth, you know, being a young person, falling in love and the you know the the idea of how difficult it is to be a young person in love with someone and wanting to sneak away with that person and be alone with that person and having to deal with parents or kid brothers or all those issues that used to come up when we were all young and experimenting with our feelings for for each other. <laughs> Put it that way. But 
those kind of issues for me were always really hard to address in songwriting. I, I never really wrote a love song, but I always envied people who could write a love song so beautifully that it was unprecedented. You know, I, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people that write these great love songs that are evocative of a time and of your a time in your life or a, or a time in history, a time in, in the decades of your life, like very seventies style song or, or 60s style song. This album, I believe came out in the seventies or no, 1980. Um, I believe it's 1980. Um, so, evocative of those days those wonderful that right between the 70s and the 80s and the late 70s early 80s and a little bit into the 80s there was so much great stuff happening and this is such a perfect pop album the songwriting is incredible glenn tilbrook's voice is so good um so emotional so unpretentious in a way that you, you know, he's not trying to rock out or anything. He's singing and he's, he is shamelessly singing in his beautiful voice. You know, when people would try to sing beautifully and, and were capable of it, that is a, that is a rare thing in, in certain eras of, of rock and roll, I guess. And a lot of people are trying to sound rugged and, and, uh, distorted and and tough you know but uh these guys were trying to sound good they were trying to write pop songs for the ages i think and the production on this is incredible you got your incredible keyboard playing um jules holland was playing a farfisa organ which had this this great sort of head bopping you know pop new wave vibe to it um the songs are about real things that were affecting real people. Um, very emotionally emotionally charged songs about reality for a person in this era of at this age. And um, I really appreciated this album when it when it came out. I think aside from my intimidation at the at the um, intense skill of <laughs> behind this record, and it's uh, making me feel like I shouldn't even try to do anything creative ever again. Um, aside from that, I, I grew, of course, I always loved this album, but I grew to love it more. Um, and I, I still listen to this every once in a while. I pop it on and, you know, pulling muscles from the shell. Just It's just a classic song. What more can you say about it? Um, another nail in my heart, you know. You got your all these great songs in here, but Separate Beds, um, that's a, that is a, a great sort of moving song. One thing that, that they were doing on here, Glenn Tilbrook and, and, uh, Chris Difford, um, Chris Difford, Glenn Tilbrook, um, the two singer, they, they both sang at the same time on some of the songs. And there's a sort of a characteristic sound that they do on this album and they do it a bit more in some of their later albums they had some hits after this album but on this album they do this thing where they do this unison singing where they're both singing the same the same lyrics the same melody but at different octaves chris difford's voice is very deep he's got a very deep deep voice and um this voice is very high so you've got a high voice and a low voice, but they're doing octaves. They're not doing a harmony of any kind of chording harmony. It's a it's an octave. So you get this double this doubling of the voice, which is uh, really interesting. It kind of unique to them. I'm not sure if I know of any other bands that did that consistently. Maybe in a song or two here and there, but they did that consistently, and it became a sort of a part of their sound. Um, and it's really interesting because it's it gives the it gives sort of a fullness and a wide spectrum to the sound of the vocals. Um, and but the thing is about this album, none of that stuff matters. The songwriting is so good that it could have just been one voice. It could have been so many other things, but you could you could take these songs and just play them on a, an acoustic guitar and sing 
and they would still be classic songs. That is a good tell of how good a song is. If you can reduce it down to one instrument and one voice, if you could have somebody sitting on a stool in a, in a nightclub strumming the chords on the guitar and singing it and, you, and the song still holds up, that right there is a good pop song. That's a good pop song. And I believe all of these songs you could do that with. I don't know if that's a, a, a good criteria for a pop song. That's not the only criteria for a good pop song, but it's one of mine. And uh, anyway, the, the band is called Squeeze. Uh, the album is called Argy Bargy. It's a classic. Um, if you have this album, if you remember this album, I, I'll bet you love it. I'll bet you have it and you listen to it once in a while and I bet you love it and still do. It's such a great album. I think it's a classic of its, of its kind. And that's all I'm gonna say about it for now. Um, maybe I'll go back to some other Squeeze albums. And I forgot to tell you why I didn't really like the first one. Um, I'll make this quick. Evidently, they got they they played you know around and got a record deal, and somebody hooked them up with John Cale, um, incredible musician songwriter who was in Velvet Underground. You know the famous John Cale that um, much much respected. The band really liked him, uh, evidently from what I've read. They liked working with him, but what he did was he said, you know what, I like your songs that you've spent your entire musical career writing and creating and perfecting in your stage performances. But what I want you to do is throw all of those songs out and write entirely new songs right here in the studio with me as your producer, says John Cale. And so they were a little bit like, but what about our songs? What about our, our songs that we've got, you know? And so they went ahead and did it and they made this album of songs that they kind of made up on the spot and John Cale had kind of an idea, conceptual idea for that, for the band. Um, not really, evidently not really realizing that they already had that. They already had their um, conceptual concepts. And uh, so anyway, that's why I don't really like their early stuff, you know, because I, I always felt that. I didn't know that whole story until later, but I always felt like it didn't sound to me to be like a pure album by the guys in the band for some reason. I don't know why I felt that way, but I felt like it just wasn't, it wasn't what you expect from the first album of a band that is this good. Um, usually a first album is very powerful because the band has their entire career, their entire first part of their lives to create those songs. Um, you develop them, you play them out in the clubs and you play them for, you know, you rehearse them for years and then when you make your first album, you have those songs down. So you go in and you make the first album and the first album has an energy and a power usually. Um, but John Cale made them throw all those songs out and make new ones up on the spot, which is an interesting idea in some ways. But um, And I don't think the band has too much animosity towards John Cale. I, every t article I've read that mentions that they seem to like, oh, he's a good guy. We enjoyed working with him. He was very inspiring, but I think the album wasn't what it could have been or should have been. But anyway, Argy Bargy is where it really happened, I think. That's that's the first album that, that really is just great. It's a, it's a much beloved album too, I think. And uh, fortunately, they, they survived that uh, first, their first album and their first work uh, with that sort of misguided idea. Um, but anyway, squeeze. That's all I'm going to say. Now I'm really going to say bye. Take care. Thanks for listening. And I will talk to you again real soon. <laughs>